Alhamdulillah, we're able to gather for another session and begin the tafsir of a new surah of the Holy Quran, one of the longer surahs, surah number nine, which is known as Surah at tawbah Now, Surah at tawbah according to the Mufassireen, the tafsir that I've read, this surah actually has about 10 names. And the most common names for this surah is, of course, Surah at tawbah the chapter of repentance. It's also known as Surah Bara'a, the, uh, the chapter of repudiation. And it's also known as Surah Al-Fadiha, which means the surah that exposes. And inshallah, we'll speak a little bit about this. Now, one of the distinguishing features of Surah at tawbah is that it doesn't begin with the Basmala. There are 114 chapters in the Holy Quran. All of them begin with the verse Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And you'll notice if you open the Mus'haf that you don't find the Basmala at the beginning of this surah. Now several reasons have been put forward by the commentators of the Holy Quran. Some of them have said that Surah at tawbah has no basmala because it's a continuation of Surah Al-Anfal, which is the eighth Surah of the Holy Quran. And it has, and essentially has the same theme. So some commentators of the Quran, they consider Surah Al-Anfal and Surah at tawbah to be one single Surah. And they basically call the last part of the surah as Tawbah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially announces the, uh, the, uh, the nullification of the treaty that the Holy Prophet uh, initiated with the Mushrikeen. So this is one view, that Surah Tawbah and Surah Al-Anfal are one surah and hence it does not begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Now, if you look at the riwayat of Ahlul Bayt, salawatullahi alayhim ajma'een, the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam specifically Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, he was asked about the reason why the surah does not begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. To which the Imam alayhi salam said, so, so, so basically just to recap, there are some commentators of the Qur'an that believe that Surah Al-Anfal and Surah Al-Tawbah are one Surah, and hence it has no basmal. The other opinion is that no, they are two separate Surahs, and the reason why Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim has been omitted is explained by the following tradition from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, where he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim lil amani wal-Rahma wa nazalat bara'atun li raf'i al-amani wal-sayfi fih. The Imam alayhi salam, he explains that the phrase Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is meant to convey security and mercy. While the aim and the objective of this surah is to basically negate security and it's a declaration of conflict and war so it doesn't make sense for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to begin with bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim when essentially this surah is a declaration of conflict and war now so this the the message the ethos of surah at tawbah is divine wrath and Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is inconsistent with the message of divine wrath and the declaration of war. Now, it's important for me to mention that we, we do have a narration from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq salawatullahi alayhi where he says, Al-Anfal wal-Bara'a wahida that Surah Al-Anfal and Surah At-Tawbah are one. 
Now, at first glance, this riwayah from Imam Sadiq seems to support the first view that Surah Al-Anfal and Surah At-Tawbah are one surah, and hence it does Surah At-Tawbah does not begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. However, we can reconcile this hadith with the hadith from Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen by saying that they are two separate surahs. However, the message and the theme and the topics that are covered in both surah are very similar. We have examples of this with other surahs of the Holy Quran. So for example, Surah Al-Fil and Surah Quraysh are considered one surah that is divided and interrupted by Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So for example, in the in the prayers, in the obligatory prayers that we offer, you have to recite Surah Al-Fatiha and another surah. If you were to recite Surah Al-Fatiha and recite Surah Al-Fil, your prayer would be incomplete. Because if you recite Surah Al-Fil, you have to recite Surah Quraysh. If you want to recite Surah Al-Duha, Wal-Duha wa layli idha saja, you also have to recite Surah Alam Nashrah Laka Sadrak. Because these surahs are considered one in their message singular in their message so in the same way that surah al-fil and surah quraish are are considered one even though they are technically two surahs and the same goes for, for surah al-duha and surah al-inshirah surah al-anfal and surah at are similar they are two separate surahs and the reason why there are two separate surahs, and the reason why the basmala is removed from Surah at tawbah is as Imam Amir al Mu'mineen explained. Now, the surahs that we covered in our previous sessions, we gave we did the tafsir of Surah al, al An'am, which was a late Meccan surah, as you remember. Surah Al Najm, we also covered, which was also a Meccan surah. When we were studying Meccan Quran, we were studying a very vulnerable community. The Muslims in Mecca were the religious minority. They were the persecuted. Many of them had to migrate to different regions of the Arabian Peninsula. So therefore, the Muslims were vulnerable. They were weak. However, with Surah at tawbah Surah at tawbah is actually one of the final surahs of the Holy Quran that were revealed to the Prophet in Medina. So Surah Al-Anfal and Surah At-Tawbah are surahs that were revealed to a community that is well established. You see brothers and sisters, the Holy Prophet ﷺ when he migrated from Mecca to Medina, he actually established a government. He established a state. And therefore you find that after the establishment of the Islamic State in Medina, whereby the Holy Prophet is the head of state, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals surahs like Surah Al-Anfal. Now when you establish a new ummah, when you establish a new government, one of the most important questions that arise relate to defense. You're now a sovereign state. You've established a government. Now you have to be considered with how to protect yourself from your enemies. And therefore you find that Surah Al-Anfal deals heavily with the topic of defense. How the Prophet is to defend himself against enemies, against his adversaries. And you find that Surah At-Tawbah continues that discussion. Because Surah At-Tawbah and Surah Al-Anfal, they really deal with the topic of defense. How the Muslim community is to defend themselves. How they are to engage in... How, 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 what are the guidelines for political relationships? How to deal with treachery when it comes to treaties that are signed? So Surah At-Tawbah deals with the polytheists in Mecca. The Holy Prophet 
entered into a number of covenants with them. There was a breach of contracts and agreements. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides the Prophet on how to deal with the polytheists in Mecca. Furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how the Prophet is to deal with Ahlul Kitab and how some of the teachings of Ahlul Kitab is actually tantamount to polytheism. So even though they are recipients of divine revelation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about you know, pro problematic ideologies and idea uh, beliefs that exist among the Ahlul Kitab. So Allah in the beginning of the surah deals with the mushrikeen of Mecca. He also deals with the Ahlul Kitab who are also guilty of shirk. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the surah, he also transitions to a discussion about the munafiqeen, the hypocrites. And it's interesting that the, the stern tone that Allah uses with the mushrikeen, with Ahlul Kitab, is actually continued when he speaks about the munafiqeen, the hypocrites around the Holy Prophet. Now, just as a quick overview, you know, some of the topics that are discussed in Surah at tawbah are as follows. So the beginning of the Surah is basically an announcement that certain treaties that were signed with the polytheists have now been nullified. And we'll speak about why this takes place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Holy Prophet in this Surah to honor the treaties with those who honor them. The Holy Prophet signed many different treaties. Some of the mushrikeen violated the terms of the agreement. Others honored them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Holy Prophet to honor the tribes and adhere to the treaties with tribes that have, that have honored the, uh, the truce and the contracts. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Later on in the surah, he declares that it is forbidden for the for the mushrikeen to be caretakers of Masjid al-Haram. You know, during the time of Jahiliyyah, mushrikeen had access to the keys of the of the Kaaba. They were considered the custodians of Masjid al-Haram. Allah subhanahu wa taala also in this surah reminds the Muslims that they should trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not their numbers. You know, in the battle of Badr, Muslims were outnumbered. In Mecca, the Muslims were the minority. Now that the Muslims have established themselves, you find that in many of these battles, they are actually outnumbering their opponents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the Muslims that do not let your large numbers make you deluded. That your strength comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not your numbers. So you should not become arrogant and feel that you have the power to, to overcome and overpower your adversaries. Your trust at the end of the day should be in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands. And then the fifth topic that is mentioned in Surah at tawbah is that, you know, as I had mentioned earlier, the Jews and the Christians, even though they, they claim to be pure monotheists, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how they have also committed various forms of shirk. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah also addresses the, the expedition of Tabuk, which we will elaborate on later on in the surah, and the lessons that we draw from the expedition of Tabuk. And number seven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about those who stayed behind and did not participate in the battle of Tabuk. So here's the discussion of the munafiqeen, those who claim to be you know, ardent followers of the Holy Prophet, but they refuse to participate in battle. They make excuses as to why they wish to stay behind. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number eight, he speaks about the proper distribution of charity. That who are the rightful recipients 
of charity. And finally, the surah ends with a detailed discussion of the problem of hypocrisy in the Muslim community. Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about munafiqeen, you know, really, brothers and sisters, the takeaway message is that we should never be deceived by appearances. We should never be, you know, deceived by names. Unfortunately, many Muslims around the world today, the majority of Muslims around the world today, they have the belief that if someone lived with the Prophet, if someone was Muslim and lived alongside the Prophet, we have to consider them to be righteous and they are untouchable and they are above scrutiny or criticism. But again, Surah at tawbah is a reminder that we shouldn't be deceived by appearance because in many cases, those who are surrounding the Prophet are actually his enemies. Now this Surah is significant for a number of reasons. But mainly you find that this surah gives us a glimpse into what was happening in the last years of the Prophet's life. So this, this surah, Surah At-Tawbah, carries great historical significance because it basically gives us a glimpse into what was happening in the city of Medina. And it's a surah that has, so it has, so it's a surah that has historical significance, conceptual significance. There are many important concepts that are discussed in the surah with respect to defense, how to deal with, you know, uh, you know, enemies, how to deal with treachery, how to deal with treason in the Islamic State. And this is a surah that also gives us some guidelines with respect to rules of combat there are certain jurisprudential issues that are covered in the surah but mainly the surah highlights how the prophet was treated by his own companions how the prophet dealt with his sahaba and ultimately the pop the the problem of nifaq in the muslim community you know, usually when we think of hypocrisy in the, the lifetime of the Prophet, we straight away think of Surat al Munafiqun. However, you find that Surat at Tawbah deals at length with the problem of hypocrisy. Now, if you look at the first ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bara'atum min Allah wa rasulih ila alladheena ahadtum min al mushrikeen. Now, of course, there is no Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. However, narrations indicate, and there are even some copies of the Holy Quran that mention that before you begin the recitation of Surah at tawbah you should recite the following. So there's no basmala, but instead of the basmala, you recite, "A'udhu billahi min nar I seek refuge with Allah from the hellfire. Wa min al kuffar, and from the evil of the polytheists, the disbelievers, women jabbar, and from the anger of the Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the all powerful. And honor and glory belongs to Allah, His Messenger, and the believers. So we take the first ayah. Bara'atum min Allah wa rasulih ila alladheena ahadtum min al mushrikeen. This is a declaration of immunity from God and His Messenger towards those idolaters with whom you made a treaty. فَسِيحُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْهُرٍ وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّكُمْ غَيْرُ مُعْجِزِ اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ مُخْزِ الْكَافِرِينَ So travel freely throughout the land for four months and know that you cannot thwart God and that God shall disgrace the disbelievers. Now we take the word bara'a. Now the translation that I have translated the word bara'a to mean immunity. But I, I don't think that that is an accurate translation of the word bara'a. Bara'a 
in the Arabic language means to disown or to disavow or to distance yourself from someone or an idea. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Holy Prophet to sever the covenant that was made with some of the mushrikeen. Now, when the Holy Prophet establishes himself in Medina, you know, Medina, it was, you know, Muslims were living in Medina. There were Jews, Christians, mushrikeen living in Medina and in the surrounding areas. So the Holy Prophet naturally, as a head of state, he entered into diplomatic relations with these different groups. And there were trees signed with these different groups. And each treaty differed. And we don't really have the details about each of these treaties. But in any case, the Holy Prophet you know, one example of these treaties is the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which was signed in the sixth year after the Hijrah. And one of the agreed upon terms of that treaty was that there would be 10 years of peace between the Muslims and the Mushrikeen. Now, what had happened was the Mushrikeen, at least some of them, broke their treaty. They killed a member from among the Muslims, and there were different violations to the treaty that took place. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares that those who broke the treaty, and the, the treaty was broken on a number of occasions, but the Holy Prophet ignored it. He considered it to be, you know, small violations of the treaty. But when it came to bloodshed, this ayah is revealed. And now there is a declaration that the treaty that was signed with some of the mushrikeen, that treaty, that truce, has been that covenant is now null. And it's interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fasihu fil ardi arba'ata ashur. That after four months, this treaty, the, the nullification of this treaty is to take effect. So after four months, there is no more immunity and protection given to the mushrikeen now this surah just to give you to place it in its chronological context surah tawba is revealed in the ninth year after the hijrah so this is about a year and a half before the death of the holy prophet now mecca was conquered in the eighth year after the Hijrah. So eighth year after the Hijrah, Mecca is conquered. And you find that the violation and Hudaybiyah took place in the sixth year after the Hijrah. So this treaty was broken sometime between the, con the conquest of Mecca and then and the ninth year after the Hijrah. Now, after the Holy Prophet conquers Mecca in the eighth year after the Hijrah, he doesn't relocate. He doesn't settle in the city of Mecca. He stays there for a brief period of time. And this is when you see people entering Islam in huge groups. You know, when, when the Holy Quran says, Here the Fath is referring to the conquest of Mecca. This is when you see the Muslim community become, become very large. People be, submit to Islam. And this is when the likes of Abu Sufyan and Muawiyah become Muslim. When Mecca is conquered, the narrations say that Abu Sufyan is brought to the Holy Prophet, accompanied with Muawiyah. And Abu Sufyan realizes that Islam has become too powerful. You know, Abu Sufyan had been leading the majority of the military campaigns against the Holy Prophet in the eighth year after the Hijrah, after Badr, Uhud, and all of these military conflicts, Abu Sufyan realizes that he's powerless. He's brought before the Holy Prophet. Rasulullah says to him, 
يا أبا سفيان أما أنا لك أن تشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أو أبو سفيان Isn't it time that you acknowledge that there is no God other than Allah? Abu Sufyan says, yes, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And then the Holy Prophet says, Ya Abu Sufyan, Ama ana laka an tashhada anni Rasulullah? Isn't it time that you also admit, that you also acknowledge, that you also bear witness that I am the Messenger of Allah? The, the narrations say that he was reluctant to utter the second part of the Shahada, the Kadima. And he says, Amma, amma hadi, fa inna fil qalbi minha shay. That as for this part of the declaration of faith, I have, there's something in my heart that makes it difficult for me. And look at the irony, brothers and sisters. This man, his grand, his son, and his grandson, they end up representing the religion of Islam after the death of the Holy Prophet. So this is what happens in the eighth year after the Hijrah. Rasulullah stays in Mecca for a short period of time. He doesn't perform Hajj in that year. In the ninth year of the Hijrah, Rasulullah also does not perform Hajj. He sends individuals he sends the muslims to mecca to perform hajj so in the eighth and the ninth year after the hijrah muslims and meccans muslims and mushrikeen are performing hajj together the mushrikeen during the time of jahiliyyah during the era of ignorance they also performed hajj now, even though they were polytheists, they still held on to some Abrahamic practices. Now, of course, they distorted some of their practices. There were many innovations. But nonetheless, they performed a ritual called Hajj. So in the 8th and the ninth year after the Hijrah, you find that Hajj was performed by the Muslims and the Mushrikeen. In the 8th year after the Hijrah, when Rasulullah conquers Mecca, he purges the Kaaba of the idols. Amir al Mu'mineen and the Holy Prophet, they do this together. The narration says that when Amir al Mu'mineen and Rasulullah arrive at the Kaaba, when they enter and they see that the, the Kaaba is full of idols, the Holy Prophet says to Amir al Mu'mineen that. Well, then why don't you get on my my back climb onto my shoulders put your feet on my soldiers and then knock down the idols now initially the holy prophet says to imam amir al-mu'minin you get on my shoulders now the imam was too embarrassed to place his feet on the shoulders of the prophet so he tries to allow the prophet to climb on his shoulders Amir al-Mu'mineen says that when the Prophet tried to ascend and climb on my shoulders, I felt the weight of mountains on my shoulders. I was not able to carry him. And therefore you find that Amir al-Mu'mineen climbs on top of the shoulders of the Prophet and he knocks down the, the idols. Now in the 10th year after the Hijrah, This is the year in which the Holy Prophet decides to perform Hajj. It's known as Hajjatul Wada. So the tenth, so Mecca is conquered in the eighth year after the Hijrah. Prophet doesn't perform Hajj. Ninth year after the Hijrah, the Prophet also does not perform Hajj. Rasulullah performs Hajj in the tenth year after the Hijrah. It's his final Hajj, his farewell Hajj. And in the tenth year after the Hijrah is when. The announcement of Ghadir is made. Now, in the ninth year after the Hijrah, this is when Surah at Tawbah is revealed. Now, 
again, when you read the, fir the first ayah, it seems that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Holy Prophet, they are nullifying the treaty agreement with the mushrikeen. So at first glance, it seems, just from reading the verse, that the one who is breaking the, the covenant is Allah and his messenger. But if, but if you continue reading, you find that in, in, in the, the upcoming verses, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Holy Prophet to uphold the treaty that he has made with those who have honored it. So here, there's a declaration that we are severing this covenant because the mushrikeen are the ones who have violated the terms of the agreement. In the religion of Islam, there is great emphasis placed on honoring contracts, social contracts. The Holy Prophet ﷺ would have never nullified this agreement if it was not the mushrikeen who had broken the terms of the contract. Now, in this ayah, Allah says, Bara'atum min Allahi wa rasulih. So here, in the ninth year after the hijrah, there, were, there has been peace now for about three years. Hudaybiyah, the treaty of Hudaybiyah was in the sixth year after the hijrah. We're now in the ninth year after the hijrah. So for three years, there was relative peace. And now the ayah declares that this peace time is over. The disbelievers who honored the covenant, we will honor that, that contract with you, that treaty with you. So this is essentially a declaration of war. And then in the second ayah, Allah says, فَسِيحُ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْهُرُ That travel freely in their land for four months. Now the question is, the mushrikeen have violated and they have broken the terms of the treaty with the Prophet. There's a declaration of war. Why is there this four-month period? Why does the Quran say that they are free to travel in the land for four months? As the Quran says, so travel freely throughout the land for four months. فَسِيحُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْهُرُ وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّكُمْ غَيْرُ مُعْجِزِ اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ مُخْزِ الْكَافِرِينَ So travel freely throughout the land for four months and know that you cannot thwart God and that God shall disgrace the disbelievers. Now, it's interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want the Prophet to retaliate immediately. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow the Prophet to take immediate action. There is a four-month time period. Now, why is that? Number one, this shows you the sanctity of human blood. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want us to be reactionary. A treaty has been broken. Emotions are running high. Allah says four months. Let them, let them roam freely for four months. Now this, the reason why this is done, number one, this announcement is made, as you'll find in the next ayah, in ayah number three, وَأَذَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ So this bara'a, this, this announcement, this is an announcement from God and His Messenger to the people on the day of the greater Hajj. So this announcement was made during Hajj. Mushrikeen and Muslims are gathered in Mecca. The announcement is made. There's a declaration of war. Immunity will end after four months. Why? Because brothers and sisters, it used to take people a long time to get to Mecca. There are people from all around the Arabian Peninsula who've come from distant regions. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving them the opportunity to go back home 
to prepare for a war if that's the path that they want to take, to repent, to join the ranks of the believers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them this time period, these four months. So the announcement is made in Hajj, the greater Hajj. Now there's a, there, are, there are some different opinions about what the meaning of Al-Hajj Al-Akbar is. The greater Hajj, some have said that this is, the greater Hajj means that it's basically not Umrah. It's Hajj season. And the Ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt, they say that it's Yawmun Nahl, that it's the 10th of the Hijjah on the day of Eid. This announcement is made. And the four months begin at that point. So you have the 10th of the Hijjah, you have Muharram, you have Safar, you have Rabi'ul Awwal, on the 10th of Rabi'ul Thani, this is when the disbelievers have no more immunity and there is now a declaration of war. Those who repent and join Islam, they're fine. Those who decide that they want to go to war, the Holy Prophet is given permission to enter into a military conflict with those who breached the covenant. If we go back to the to ayah number two, so Allah gives them four months and Allah reminds them that, that don't think you're able to thwart God. You breach the contract. Do not think that war will not come to you. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ensures them that they cannot escape, they cannot make God incapable, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will indeed disgrace them for having broken the contract. وَأَذَانٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ In ayah number three, an announcement from God and His Messenger. إِلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ There are some commentators of the Qur'an that say the reason why it is called the greater Hajj is because this Hajj was performed with Muslims and Mushrikeen together. So it was greater in the sense that it had large numbers of people from different faith backgrounds. So you have Muslims and Mushrikeen together. What is the announcement? That Allah and His Messenger are that, that God and His Messenger have repudiated the idolaters. So if you repent, it would be better for you. So if you repent, it would be better for you. And if you turn away, if you refuse to repent, then know that you cannot thwart God and give the disbelievers glad tidings of a painful punishment. So as I mentioned, this announcement is made when the Muslims and the Mushrikeen are performing Hajj together. Now, it's now, according to narrations, this announcement was made a number of times during Hajj. And when this surah was revealed in the ninth year after the Hijrah, a little bit before Hajj, the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he basically instructs Abu Bakr to go and deliver these verses. Now, you find that when Abu Bakr is given these verses, and he travels from Medina to Mecca, so the Prophet is in Mecca, these verses of, of Surah Al-Tawbah uh, are revealed. He gives the verses to Abu Bakr to go and make the announcement on behalf of the Prophet. It is recorded by Ahmed ibn Hanbal in his Musnad. 
and the narration is from Ibn Abbas that the Holy Prophet sent Abu Bakr to basically make the announcement for these verses. Halfway through his journey, Jibra'il appears to the Holy Prophet and says, Ya Rasulullah, La yuballighuha that the one who delivers this message has to be either you or mink that these verses of Surah Al Bara'a can only be delivered by you or someone from you. So he calls upon Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam and he basically says go and tell Abu Bakr to come back and you go to Mecca and make this announcement that the Mushrikeen who violated the terms of the, the covenant immunity has been lifted they have no more immunity after four months and essentially you have to declare war against them so Abu Bakr when he's traveling he says that I could hear the camel of the Holy Prophet. It seems that Amir al Mu'mineen, the Holy Prophet, gives Amir al Mu'mineen his own camel. He rides it and he travels in the direction that Abu Bakr went. Abu Bakr says, I heard the, 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 the sounds coming from the camel of the Holy Prophet. I turned, I saw that it was Ali ibn Abi Talib. He told me that the Prophet wanted me to go back, and I returned. I asked why was I being sent back, and Yur al-Mu'mineen instructed me that the Holy Prophet said, this message has to be delivered by me or someone from my family. So this is recorded in Ahmed ibn Hanbal's Musnad, and there are many Sunni narrations, uh, Sunni hadith books that mention this incident now as we'll cover inshallah next week you'll find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not nullify all of the covenants because the Holy Prophet initiated treaties with different groups so the mushrikeen that honored the terms of the contract Rasulullah had no issue with them the ones who demonstrated treachery and committed treason against the state the holy prophet dealt with them in a very swift manner now as a final note it's interesting that you know anyone who has studied arabic grammar you'll find that ayah number three is a very significant verse because throughout history especially when non-muslims joined non-arabs became muslim many of them would make mistakes with the recitation of this verse now the quran that we have among us it has you know the short vowels fatha kasra banna it has the dots but during that time in the early history of islam there were no dots and there were no fatha dham or any of that in the text so when people would read this verse they would make the following mistake and I'll, I'll, I'll mention to you the mistake that they that they made and what are the implications of that mistake so the ayah says min wa ila hajj al -akbar. an announcement from god and his messenger to the people on 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 the greater hajj on the day of the greater hajj so this part is fine. And Allah min al mushrikina wa rasuluh. This is where people often make the mistake. When we say and Allah min al mushrikina wa rasuluh, many of them would say and Allah min al mushrikina wa rasuluh. So instead of adhanna they would recite it with kasra. Min al mushrikina wa rasulih. If you recite it in this way, 
it means that Allah has disavowed the polytheists, the mushrikeen, and he's also disavowed his messenger. But the meaning is that Allah and his messenger, because when you put a dhamma, if you say wa you're making the Holy Prophet also a fa'il, that he is also dis Allah and his prophet are disavowing the mushrikeen. So when people were reciting this ayah incorrectly, a man by the name of Abu Aswad al-Du'ali, one of the students of Amir al-Mu'mineen, one of the companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says to the Imam, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, many people are making mistakes with the recitation of the Qur'an, and this was cited as one of the examples. And this is where the Imam alayhi salam advises Abu Aswad al-Du'ali to give people a way, a method of learning the Arabic language properly so they don't make mistakes. And this is where the foundations of the science of Arabic grammar was established. So Arabic grammar was established and codified by the instruction of Amir al-Mu'mineen and it was his student Abu Aswad al-Du'ali that basically codified and you know gave a methodology to the science of Arabic grammar. So as you see, my dear brothers and sisters, this surah, Surah at tawbah is basically guiding the Prophet on how to deal with treachery and treason. It was revealed in the ninth year after the Hijrah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow the Holy Prophet to ignore these repeated offenses because the mushrikeen were violating the terms of the covenant, the treaty, the Prophet ignored it until it led ultimately to bloodshed. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they have no more immunity. You have permission to break this agreement with them. Now it's a declaration of war. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet to respect the treaties with other tribes who have honored it. And inshallah, as we go through the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches the Prophet again how to deal with the mushrikeen, how to deal with Ahlul Kitab, how to deal with the munafiqeen. So there are different layers of problems with the Muslim community at this period. And the Holy Prophet, as a leader of an, so the Prophet is not just a prophet, he's the head of a state. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guiding the Prophet on how to defend the Islamic State how to engage with diplomatic, uh, how to create allies, how to deal with treason, and so on and so forth, inshallah. And our next session will cover verses 3, 4, and on and, on, and onward in more depth. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin.